Hello and welcome to a fresh new edition of Political Influencers from What's In It For Africa with me, Uzo Madu. Here to uncover why the African narrative is misleading, who's responsible and how to change it, we have the pleasure of talking to communications expert and co-founder of the global campaign Africa Communications Week, Aniola Harrison. Hello. Hello. Thank you for joining us Thank today. Thank you for having me. <laughs> So to kick off the discussion in creating Africa Communications Week, a global campaign, are you saying that Africa has a PR problem? Yes, (laughs) I believe it does. Um, And actually, there is a lot of talk about changing the narrative um, about Africa. Um, But what are these narratives? Um, How can we measure them? How can we measure the impact that these narratives have on Africa's socioeconomic development? Um, And this is actually why Africa Communications Week was uh, created by uh, myself and Annie Mutamba uh, as a response to these questions. uh, How can we, as Africa-focused communicators, shape the narratives about Africa? And how can we measure the impact that these narratives have on our development? I think historically uh, it was disinformation. I think it paid certain governments, organizations, and people to uh, portray African countries as cesspools of hunger and deprivation. Uh, I think it still pays certain organizations to portray African countries in this way, which is why you know sort of uh, images of poor, starving African children still persist in communication uh, today. But I think a lot of it is also misinformation. Um, but from the point of view of lazy journalism and not taking the time uh, to do the research that is necessary to provide a more nuanced and balanced narrative, to, to provide an accurate reflection of the realities across the continent, which is in fact very, very complex. It is not a single story. And in terms of responsibility, Professor Aseka, a renowned political historian and Fulbright scholar, has said that African media has failed to aggressively market an African identity and authenticity to challenge the one imposed by the West. How would you respond to such a statement? I agree with this statement. At the Africa Communications Week event uh, hosted in Lagos last week, one of our speakers, uh, Mrs. Topoma George Taylor, quoted an excerpt from a book, Working on a Dream by uh, Bolaha Fagbure, about um, how he felt when Stephen Keshi died. Stephen Keshi is a one of Nigeria's most prolific uh, footballers. Uh, He's also uh, contributed to African football in general as a coach, not only for Nigeria, but for other West African countries. And when he he died, his death was announced as an addendum, you know, at the end of a news segment on radio. And the truth of the matter is, if we do not celebrate our own uh, achievements, our own success stories, we don't tell our own stories, Somebody else will tell those stories, and more than likely, they will tell them in a manner that we do not like. And so I want to focus now on the fact that communications is about sharing knowledge. And the central space for for doing this is commonly found within higher education institutions, so universities. But in fact, there's been a general decline in the number of academic articles published by African-based scholars in top African studies journals. So it seems that Africans ourselves are not giving space to African narratives. What do we do about this? So I think this is a very complex, uh, complex question and there are different ways to solve it. But I think, first of all, we really need to fix our education system, particularly higher education. Uh, we need to provide funding for African scholars to do research. Research takes funding. It's actually, it, you know, it has to be priority uh, for governments. And if it's not priority for governments, then this is a space I think that uh, the private sector can take leadership. Uh, and, and this is what actually in other countries, uh, a lot of countries do. But our scholars need to be paid well, and they need to have funding to do the research that's necessary. Another uh, angle about this is I think our experts actually need PR. They need to be given, they need to be pushed forward. I think there needs to be a deliberate push uh, for greater representation of African experts, mathematicians, professors, academics, 
on the world stage, not just in Africa focused journals or African themed events as it's want to happen now, but wherever a conversation is taking place, a global conversation is taking place, there has to be representation of African voices. Uh, and this is something that I think Ames is doing really, really well. The communication team at Ames is providing and putting forward African scientists and mathematicians. So work is going on in this regard, but there's still a lot more to be done. Um, our experts need PR. And carrying on with the education side of things, um, African countries learn an extensive amount about the Western world, not only in the media, but also in their own education systems. But there's not the same emphasis in Western education systems in learning about the African continent, its cultures, its vast amount of languages and socio-economic structures. But yet the African narrative is largely shaped by Western institutions. Um, why is this and what can, what can be done? I think in order for us to actually tell our own stories uh, and to shape the narratives about our continent, we actually need to understand our history. So my answer, to, my short answer to this question is teach history, teach civics, teach government. I think history, civics and government should be mandatory from primary school. I shouldn't have to be learning about the Civil War and Biafra when I'm an adult. I should have learned about it when I was five years old. We learn about our history, we understand how it's connected to our modern day, we understand how the, the, you know, our continent is so complex, uh, you know, how these things work together to shape who we are today. And we also learn about history to, so that we don't make the mistakes of, of the past. Uh, and so for me, my simple answer is we need to focus on our own history, learning it, understanding it, uh, and, and promoting it, actually, in fact, that this is, this is my general, um, that would be my answer to this question. And so I want to ask you, what are the consequences of a misleading African narrative? I actually think that a misleading African narrative has an impact, has a real impact on GDP. It actually has an impact on, you know, euros, dollars, cents on the bottom line. I think it impacts investment. Um, I think it impacts uh, the way Africans actually trade with each other, intra-African trade, for example. Uh, it impacts uh, the narratives. Our narratives shape how we view each other. So perception, I think, shapes, uh, shapes behaviors. And if we have a deficient view of each other, even as Africans, then we're not working together for a common cause. Um, and I'll give you a perfect example is the issue of visa-free travel within Africa, for example. Why should I have to struggle for a visa to go to, to Morocco or to go to Kenya when a Westerner could easily just hop on a plane and go there? And that says a lot for even intra-African trade. And that's, uh, that is just one example, I think, of the impact that these negative um, narratives or these misleading narratives um, have even on us within the continent, not to talk of external uh, uh, external uh, countries. And because we're sat here in um, the political capital, at least the EU political capital here in Brussels, a major milestone for the relationship between Europe and Africa is coming up in the form of the EU-Africa Summit. It takes place in Cote d'Ivoire on the 28th and 29th of November. Now, if you were the communications advisor for the African Union, what would be your strategy for this upcoming summit? And also, you know, taking into account that this summit is going to shape the relationship, the investment, the trade between these two very important continents. I think the first thing is that um, the head of communications or the chief communication officer has to have a seat at the decision-making table in order for whatever for a truly strategic uh, plan. And and the, and until communication officers across board, so just not in the AU across board, uh, have a seat at the table, we will continue to have more sort of a tactical approach as opposed to a strategic approach. Now, in in light of what is coming on, I think. We need to define what our messaging is um, and ensure that we shape that and get that messaging out and shape that narrative. Uh, the moment uh, the, you know that this conference happens or the summit happens, we need to be putting out our own messages first and d actually define what it is that we want out of this summit and define how we want to position the AU, position what we're saying um, about ourselves. So uh, for me, the messaging is absolutely important. Well, thank you very much for your time thank on you. Political Influences. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you for watching Political Influencers and be sure to keep up to date with What's In It For Africa's news and analysis on our website, Facebook and Twitter pages. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check us out on Afroland TV and Quick TV Africa.